All right, well, welcome everyone to the National Green Building Standard 2020, What You Need to Know. This course is approved for many of the CUs, BPI, GBCI, AIBD, uh, and many others, as well as AIA, Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. My name is Brett Little, um, and I'm here with the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the places we live. And today we're gonna to be talking about how do we live greener, make our spaces greener with the NGBS 2020 standard. And before I turn it over to our speaker, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Mitsubishi Electric. Mitsubishi provides all your heating, cooling, filtration needs all in one system. Today's low load homes require right-sized equipment that most systems, especially gas-fired, can no longer meet. Mitsubishi has low load, high efficient heat pumps that dehumidify and cool in the summer and work in reverse in the winter. Going ductless also reduces costs and makes it easier to meet many green building certification programs uh, when you're using those systems. Ductless mini splits can now be hidden in many different places to help meet your client's needs and so can ducted systems be added if necessary. Ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to ensure a beautiful space and can now be retrofitted in to replace the furnace in existing single family or multifamily projects. Check out the dry mode to set your system up when cooling is not needed uh, to help remove excess humidity. Hyperheat takes these things way down to negative 13 and backup strip heaters can kick on during those very, very rare and coldest of cold days that barely ever happen anymore. Each room of a house can be customized comfort while still being all electric and energy efficient for clients with different needs, only to heat and cool rooms that need it. This also works multifamily and commercial centralized variable refrigerant flow or VRF systems uh, to serve whole buildings. As you can see here, uh, VRF heat technology permits for simultaneously heating and cooling as this illustration depicts um, as necessary. So go to uh, Mitsubishi Comfort and check them out today. Also, if you need to get a little more robust energy, you can check out our second sponsor, Water Furnace International. Water Furnace uh, uses the natural heating and cooling of the earth through ground source heat pump technology, which is the most uh, energy efficient heating and cooling on the planet and can help create hot water. Uh, anything can be used, force air, radiant, combo, boiler replacement, dual fuel, and many other options. Uh, and depending on your setup, there's gonna be different ways that you're gonna have drilling involved, which can add to different costs. And there's even newer uh, uh, innovations in drilling that can allow them to be used in tighter lots. You can learn more at um, Geothermal for All. All right, so I wanna welcome our sit, uh, 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 speaker, Cindy. She is a senior manager of green building programs at the Home Innovation Research Lab. In this role, she provides strategic support to the National Green Building uh, Green Certification Program. Uh, Cindy leads a diverse teams and development of new program features and tools that are utilized by verifiers and developers seeking green certification. So with that, Cindy, I'm gonna hand it over to you and then you can take it away. Great, thanks so much, Brett. Thanks for everyone who's joined us so far. All right, so um, today's session is called New and Approved Expanded Certification Opportunities Under the 2020 National Green Building Standard. Um, Sorry, Cindy, we lost you. You're muted there. There you go. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, I was I was saying today's session is called New and Improved Expanded Certification Opportunities Under the 2020 NGBS. So today we're going to look at a brief background on the NGBS standard and Home Innovations NGBS Green Certification Program. Then we're going to look at several major changes that were introduced to the 2020 NGBS. If you're not familiar with Home Innovation Research Labs, we're a 56-year-old product testing and certification laboratory located just outside DC. Our expertise is in residential construction and we have diverse teams that work on market research, product testing and certification, building science research and standards development. Our corporate mission is to improve quality, durability, affordability and environmental performance of America's housing stock. 
And one of the ways that we live that mission is through our efforts to expand the market for residential green certification. So before we dive deeper into the content, I wanted to get a sense for today's audience. So the first poll question that we're gonna ask you to respond to is, please describe your primary job function. And you can select architect or designer, energy rater or green verifier, builder or developer, product manufacturer or other. Going to wait maybe a couple more seconds to get a few more responses. Yep, and we'll close that in five, four, three, two, one. And so it looks like we're at about 52% um, architect or designer, 9% energy rater, and 36% green building consultant or verifier with just 3% builders. Okay, great. Thanks so much for walking us through that, Brett. Um, looks like we have a pretty good group here today. And the next question is, I work on the following projects. So you can select all that apply. Single family new construction, single family renovation, multifamily new construction, multifamily renovation, or neighborhood like subdivision development. to select all the different types of projects that you work on. All right, I'm gonna close that in five, four, three, two, one. So it looks like we've got a winner here for single family new construction at 73%, single family renovations at 68%, uh, and 56% multifamily. Uh, new construction, 41% renovation, multifamily, and then 34% neighborhoods. Okay, great. Yeah, well, there's going to be something for everyone during today's session, but I'll make sure to especially focus on the single family content because that's going to be the majority of what's relevant to you all. So great. Thanks for responding to that. And one last question for now. How familiar are you with the NGPS? You can select expert, fair or not at all? All right, five, four, three, two, one. So it looks like uh, we've got uh, a pretty even tie with fair and not familiar at all. So a lot of uh, newbies here, great. Great. Yeah, I'm glad you all joined and hopefully you get some good takeaways from the 2020 NGPS. All right, fantastic. So with that, we can close out the poll. And so in terms of background, the first version of the National Green Building Standard was created in 2008. Around that time, the market was characterized by some local regional green building programs and a few national programs that tended to be more costly or didn't have processes that really aligned with residential construction. They tended to be national programs that were first created for commercial and then pigeonholed or adapted to fit residential. And it oftentimes didn't work for residential budgets or re residential timelines. Um, there was a need for a green building rating system that was specifically designed for residential. And from that need, the National Green Building Standard was born. The NGBS was designed to be voluntary above code reading system that applied to all residential occupancies and building types. The NGBS stands apart um, because of its consensus development process. The NGBS was developed through a process that involved builders, developers, code officials, government, product manufacturers, and others. And the standards approval as an ANSI standard is evidence of an open and balanced consensus development process. The NGPS is the first solely residential green building standard to be included among the ICC suite of I codes that form a comprehensive and coordinated set of building codes. 
and the NGPS is also approved as an ASHRAE standard. As the industry standard for green residential development, the NGPS is embedded within the IGCC, the International Green Construction Code. So when a city or county adopts the IGCC, the NGPS is an alternative compliance path for multifamily residential buildings and the residential portion of mixed use buildings, as well as the sole compliance path for single family homes, townhomes, and low rise residential buildings. And this is significant because more and more larger jurisdictions are starting to adopt the IGCC. A couple examples are Dallas, Texas, Washington, DC, and Montgomery County, Maryland. And when the city or county adopts the IGCC as their overlay code, the developers often choose to do the NGBS compliance path because it's much more straightforward and flexible than the IGCC provisions. So what makes the NGBS different? Um, first, it's comprehensive both in its broad residential scope as well as its breadth of green building practices. The NGBS is much more than a design standard. There are practices that address design, construction, verification, and operations and maintenance. It's written in code language so that it's really easy for industry professionals and contractors to pick it up and quickly understand what the practices entail. The NGPS includes a few mandatory provisions, but is otherwise expansive, flexible, and point-based. Um, there's over 600 practices to choose from. So no matter the building design, geography, neighborhood resources, or whatever, the residential project can demonstrate exceptional levels of sustainable construction. And finally, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but the NGBS includes specialized energy efficiency criteria for the tropical climate zone, which makes it a really good option for those um, working on developments in areas like Puerto Rico, where there is a HUD requirement for green certification in order to achieve um, some of the specialized financing that's available for redevelopment. So, as I said before, all mandatory practices must be met. And then beyond that, the project team selects uh, optional practices to meet their desired certification target. Um, and then everything is verified on site by independent third party verifiers. If you're familiar with other green rating systems, the categories of green building practice should be no surprise. These are the main categories for the new construction compliance pathway. Lot design and development, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, indoor environmental quality, and operations and maintenance. Compliance with the NGBS is not based on an overall point accumulation. To comply, buildings must meet minimum point requirements in each and every chapter as well as overall. This makes the NGBS really rigorous and ensures a comprehensive achievement of green practices. A project can't bank the majority of its points, for example, in the lot design section or the energy efficiency section. It needs to be high performing across the board. And then to move up from one level to another, so let's say from bronze to silver, the project must be higher performing in each and every category as well as overall. So Home Innovation serves as adopting entity for the NGPS standard and certifies construction projects as compliant. And in doing this work, our focus is on eliminating barriers to residential green certification, um, both real and perceived. We have worked hard to keep our certification fees low. We don't charge for registration, technical assistance, or interpretations. And we've really worked with our partners to make sure that we're not unnecessarily passing on higher costs through difficult or inflexible certification uh, processes or steps. We work really closely with our partners and learn from their experience and adapt over time. And given the fact that we are a product testing and certification laboratory, quality assurance is in our DNA. So in short, the NGBS green value proposition is affordable, rigorous, and credible green certification for residential construction. This is the certification process from the builder's perspective. So first, the builder will score their project using our Excel-based scoring tools. Um, this serves as the tool in which the design team kind of maps out the project, but it also is the same file in which the verifier works when he or she is conducting inspections. And then that same file is sent along to us 
later in the process when we're doing our review for certification. Next, the builder hires the verifier. The verifier is the one that registers the project and they often will um, guide the builder through the process. They'll serve as a training and support um, resource for, throughout the certification timeline. Um, during construction, there's at least two inspections required for most types of projects. Um, the first inspection is pre-drywall and then another at final once everything is complete. Um, when all the inspections have been complete, the verifier sends along their documentation to home innovation. We review 100% of the verification reports that come to our team. And if everything is complete and accurate, we issue certification within one business day. Um, so that's the, the process. And so now let's get back to the NGPS. Um, so the first version was released in 2008. That version has since been sunset. The 2012 version um, is only available now for projects that have been previously registered. So the deadline was December 31st, 2019. And then those projects that had registered by that date now have one to two years to complete their construction um, to be certified under that version. The 2015 NGBS is currently the most widely used version. Um, and some might assume that that's naturally the first place that people should look if they're going to get started with the program now. However, I would also say that the 2020 NGBS, which was released this spring, is a great alternative given the number of updates and new opportunities available within that version. And um, so people shouldn't naturally assume that the 2015 version is the first place to go. Um, I would encourage people to really take a look at the 2015 and 2020 carefully, figure out what will work best for that project. And our teams release a number of decision trees and blog posts on how to decide um, between the two. Um, and you can ping me afterward if you want access to those. So the 2020 NGBS is based on the 2018 IECC, IRC, and IBCC. These serve as the reference standards for the, the program. These are the major updates that we're going to walk through today. So first, the 2020 NGBS has an expanded definition of residential. There's a new certification opportunity for commercial space. There's been some updates to the renovation pathway to add more flexibility. There is a new certified level for homes, townhomes, and quads. There is a new water efficiency performance path. And then finally, there's NGBS Green Plus which is an optional special recognition opportunity for homes with higher performing features in one or more categories. So this NGBS Green Plus wasn't directly included within the 2020 NGBS standard. However, it's a new offering that was developed by Home Innovation that's based on achievement of selected 2020 NGBS practices. So that's why I'm gonna to touch on it a bit today. So now we have our final poll question, which asks, which of these 2020 revisions are you most excited about or most interested in learning about? You can select expanded scope, commercial space certification, renovation changes, single family certified path or water performance path. All right, close that in five, four, three, Two, one. So it looks like we've got a clear winner uh, on the single family path at 50% and then an even tie on water performance, renovation, commercial, and then expanded scope at the least. Okay, great. I think that makes sense given that so many people said that they were predominantly involved with single family new construction projects. Great, really helpful. So first, let's look at that expanded definition of residential. So previously, the NGBS was uh, restricted to apply to only residential occupancies as defined by the IRC. Now, the NGBS um, has expanded that um, 
it's expanded what is defined as residential. And also there is now a opportunity for mixed use buildings to have the entire building certified, not just the residential portion. So the 2020 NTVS different definition is much more expansive because it includes all buildings that are residential in nature, where people and families sleep and live. So this includes buildings within the IRC residential definitions, group R occupancies within the IBC, and then assisted living facilities, residential board and care facilities, and group I1 occupancies as defined in the IBCC, excuse me, IBC, um, that are considered residential. So this opens up the NGBS to be much more relevant to a broader um, expansive buildings, including hotels, motels, convents, monasteries, assisted living, and alcohol and drug rehabilitation centers, among others. So we've gotten a couple inquiries so far about hotels and motels being certified, um, a lot of senior living and assisted living facilities as well. I'm really excited about this change. And the 2020 NGBS included a new definition for sleeping unit. A sleeping unit is a room or space in which people sleep but also includes provisions for living, eating, or other sanitation, or kitchen, but not both. This is different than the existing definition of dwelling unit, which has been um, a single unit that complies complete independent living facilities for one or more persons, including permanent provisions for living, sleeping, cooking, eating, and sanitation. So a typical apartment would be considered a dwelling unit under the NGBS, and then in comparison, a hotel, which typically has a bathroom, but not a kitchen, will meet the sleeping unit definition. Um, so throughout the standard, there's different directions for where a dwelling unit or sleeping unit must apply with certain requirements. And um, this just provides definition for that new term. So Brett, have we gotten any questions about the expanded residential definition? Uh, no, nothing specific to that. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Um, the next topic that we're going to focus on is the mixed use building certification. Um, this is a new option that applies to mixed use buildings where they can either um, be certified as core and shell meeting the green certification or full fit out. So certification of the non-residential space is new and it's optional. So developers can always seek to get just the residential portion certified, or if they are certifying the residential portion, they can decide to pursue the commercial space certification as well and get the whole entire building certified. What's not uh, available is the option to just get the commercial space certified without the residential portion. Um, you either do both or you just do the residential, you can't just choose commercial only. If the developer wants to seek certification for the non-residential space, there are two options, core and shell, which addresses the building envelope, or full fitted out and equipped, which um, is done once the whole non-residential space is completed and built out. If the developer decides they do wanna seek certification for the entire space, the residential portion earns bronze, silver, gold, or emerald, and the non-residential space earns certified. That's the only level available for non-residential spaces. And this pathway has only mandatory practices, so all relevant practices must be implemented. There are no exceptions. The core and shell compliance uh, practices are limited to insulation and air sealing primarily, um, building thermal envelope insulation, insulation installation, building thermal envelope fenestration, building thermal envelope sealing, and air barrier verification. In addition, if there are ducts installed, the commercial space must be compliant with the duct air sealing practice. And if the building has an attached garage, then the building must comply with a set of practices for sealing between the garage and the conditioned space. In general, we expect most core and shell certifications to be registered and processed along with the residential portion. However, the developer does have the option to seek 
or in shell certification after the residential space has already been certified. There's just a higher certification fee when the two um, compliance, uh, you know, sections are processed separately because it's two separate scoring tools and reviews. Buildings can also seek the full fitted out and equipped option. Um, and this means that they comply with all relevant practices within chapter 13. The verification certification can occur at the same time as the residential portion if it's completed at that time, or it can be submitted later on after the residential portion has already been certified. So when we released the scoring tools for 2020, we split out single family versions and multifamily versions. And these two tools are generally the same, except that the multifamily version includes new tabs to support the commercial space certification. So this is the commercial space verification tab. This is the main space where people will design their projects to meet the commercial space certification. And it's the tool that the verifier will use during inspections to ensure compliance. Um, on this tab, the team will select either full or core and shell. And then the practices that are relevant to that option are shown or hashed out depending on what's relevant. So that's everything related to the mixed use building certification. Um, I see that there's something coming in on the chat box, so I'll pause and see if we have any questions. Yeah, there is. Um, core and shell counts as certifying the res residential space, yes? So the residential space needs to be certified, and that's a bronze, silver, gold, or emerald level recognition. And then for the commercial space, you can choose to do either core and shell or full fit out, and either one earns the certified level. Um, hopefully that answered their question. If not, feel free to follow up. Um, okay, looks like it did. Um, so this is a great question here, uh, and it's something we've seen a lot of issues with when, when you have a, a situation with a detached community building that's outside of the portfolio, and it's, you know, maybe it's a community building or a garage, but it's required to get certified maybe because of a tax credit or something. So how does that fit into your program? Or perhaps you're gonna address that later. Yeah, that's a great question. So even before the 2020 NGBS was released, we had the option to certify accessory structures. Um, so this is defined, I think in the 2015 version, it was Appendix D of the standard. Um, and essentially it's just a, um, it's similar that the, that accessory structure needs to meet similar practices of the new construction compliance criteria, but it doesn't need to hit all of the point threshold targets. So for example, if there is like a smaller, like music practice space, and they're not necessarily putting, or like a home office studio, and they're not necessarily planning to put in a kitchen or a full bathroom, some practices won't be relevant to that structure. And so there would be a lower point threshold for water efficiency, for example. Um, we've certified accessory structures that are adjacent to multifamily projects, as well as for single family homes. If there's a, you know, a detached structure in the backyard of a single family um, building. So there isn't a specific tool for accessory structures because it's, it's kind of a one-off, but feel free to reach out to me and we can work through that if you have a specific project in mind. Great, that's all the questions, thank you. Okay, awesome. So the next section focuses on the renovation changes. Um, the 2020 NGBS brought significant changes to the renovation section. Um, and this reflects some changes that we've seen in the market. So the last couple of years, there's been a huge increase in multifamily projects seeking renovation certification, um, buildings of all sizes and all scopes of projects. And this is in part driven by the Oh, Cindy, can you hear me? I think it froze. Yeah, I can hear you. 
Yeah, I can't hear you anymore. It looks like it just froze. Okay, now it looks like it's coming back. Yep, now, yep, everything just completely okay. froze on my end, so sorry. Sorry about that. I think sometimes my internet's a little fuzzy. Um, so I was saying that over the last couple of years, there's been a huge increase in multifamily renovation projects seeking green certification. This is largely driven by the HUD MIP reduction, which provides significant financial benefits for green certification, but also building owners are seeing value in the increased building valuation, marketability, and operational savings that comes from green certification. So the 2020 NGBS Consensus Committee really overhauled the whole remodeling section. So first, there had been a pathway for functional areas to be certified when they were remodeled. So this was like certification of individual like kitchens, bathrooms, basements, or small additions. Um, that went away because there really wasn't much appetite for that in the market that had very few projects um, pursuing that route. And then second, the committee made widespread revisions to the whole building remodeling provisions. Um, that's what's included in chapter 11. So they added prescriptive paths for energy and water efficiency, and they also maintained the performance paths as well. So people have flexibility, they can choose to do um, prescriptive for water and performance for energy or vice versa, um, and pick and choose. There's also a requirement that buildings must be occupied for a minimum of five years prior to NGBS registration. So it restricts the chapter to buildings that have been, it's not new construction, they need to be at least occupied for five years. At the same time, they allow some flexibility because now there's a three year look back for setting the before conditions for the performance pathways. So if there's been remodeling project, remodeling activities that have been done over the last three years, that can be counted as part of the upgrades as part of the green certification. Cindy, can I ask a quick clarification question? Yep, sure. You say the word occupied for five years, but what happens if a home was built and you know sat vacant for five years, no one occupied it, but it was built five years ago, and then, I mean, that's rare, but let's just say that it happened. Uh, or there was a huge economic downturn or whatever, um, is it is it actually occupied or is it built within five years? The exact language is related to when the certificate of occupancy was released by the local jurisdiction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's review how Chapter 11 works. So for Chapter 11, a lot of the numbering parallels the that of the new construction pathway. Um, there's a lot of similar practices that are shared by both the new construction pathway and the renovation section. Remodeled buildings must comply with all the mandatory practices that are relevant. Um, and there's generally the same mandatory practices within both compliance pathways. And I say that they're rel they need to be addressed when they're relevant. Um, so unaltered so let's say that a building isn't planning to open up the walls and make changes to the thermal envelope. So therefore, envelope testing, uh, like lower door testing, would not be required because it's not relevant. Or similarly, the mandatory practice for tile-backed materials would not be relevant if the renovation project did not include plans to replace tiled areas where they weren't, where what it wouldn't be green to force a project to unnecessarily make additional changes, replace those tiled areas if that was not originally part of the scope. Um, there are some exceptions, like for safety and moisture management. Um, however, that's largely the ethos throughout the whole chapter. With that said, if there are attributes of the building that comply with particular practices before the remodel, and they will remain in place post renovation, they're eligible to earn points. So if you're keeping the same Energy Star dishwashers, for example, pre and post renovation, those would be able to earn points even if they were included in the space prior to the renovation. 
So as I said before, there's performance and prescriptive paths for energy and water, and you can mix and match those two. And then for the remaining green categories, you need to earn enough points for the desired certification level. So this is a little bit different than the new construction section where you have to hit point minimums in each and every section. For renovation, you need to hit a point threshold that's um, comprehensive of all the non-energy and water sections. So lot development, resource efficiency, indoor environmental quality, and operations and maintenance. So what that looks like is this. So if it's a bronze level renovation project, they have to hit a minimum of 88 points um, in all of the non-energy and water sections. Um, and then if you choose to do the performance path for energy or water, you must first determine the baseline energy and water use pre-renovation, and then compare that with an estimate of post-renovation, how much um, water efficiency or energy efficiency has been gained through the renovation activities. So because this is largely a uh, performance base where we're looking at a increase in efficiency, many older buildings can earn even higher levels of certification because they're so inefficient to begin with. Um, and I think this is really great because it kind of levels the playing field between buildings that are much, much older and those that are more newly built. So if it's a project seeking bronze level certification and is pursuing the performance path for energy and water, it'd have to hit 15% reduction in energy use and at least 20% reduction in water use. Alternatively, a project can utilize the prescriptive paths for water and energy to demonstrate compliance. These are new pathways that might be advantageous for projects that may be more limited in their scope or might not have the budget to do extensive energy modeling um, as part of their, their project. So compliance is based on overall point accumulation of these sections with the point thresholds shown here. So if the project's pursuing prescriptive path for both energy and water, they have to hit a minimum of 30 points for energy, 25 points for water. All right, Brett, any more questions about renovation? Um, uh, yeah, there's a pretty in-depth question here and they might wanna, maybe you can give a quick answer, but um, is can you provide any more detail on the NGBS reference home energy performance calculation? Specifically, what is the equation that's applied? So for renovation, it's a simple reduction in energy or reduction in water. Um, more specifically, for like for energy, it's a reduction in energy divided by the square footage, whereas water is based on total area. Um, but yeah, for this, it's a very basic before compared to after conditions. Um, well, if we're looking at new construction, the reference home is a bit more complex because it's based on the IECC inputs and mm -hmm. um, like efficiency for products. And I mm -hmm. can send something to you after the program that explains that in more detail. Um, so uh, there's another question here, and I think I can also help a little bit. I think, um, is it what kind of tools do you allow? Um, is it the HERS index rating? Do you allow the Department of Energy's home energy score, which is specifically made for renovations? Do you allow, I mean, it's kind of, I know people, every, you know, everybody and their, and their grandma has a, a modeling software, right? I mean, how accurate it is, is hard to say anymore. So where do you draw the line on what you allow with these softwares uh, in your program? Yeah, so for renovation, you have your choice. You can do energy modeling to show the energy and water efficiency gains, or you can use a analysis based on utility bills. So we typically see people submitting energy models. Um, and then for water, we have a tool that we developed in-house that supports the 
the demonstration of the water performance gains. Um, for the energy modeling, we have a modeling policy that's available to our verifiers, which outlines um, allowable softwares. It's a lot of the software programs that you're probably already familiar with, from rate, ecotrope, energy gauge, et cetera. Um, and so utility, if you take the utility pathway, do you actually have to wait a full year after the project to report out the real data? How does that work? Yeah, so to be honest, I've never seen a project choose that route. It's typically always the energy model, but I always mention it because it is called out in the standard as an option. Um, so what it would be doing, it, would, it wouldn't be required to wait a full year post construction. We would expect that the certification materials would still come to us right when construction is complete. It would be more of a, a hybrid where they're looking at um, a full year of utility bills for a prior period that um, encompasses the before conditions and then an estimate of expected utilities afterward, probably based on an energy model analysis. Mm -hmm. One thing I've always told people about your program, um, and I'm glad it stayed the same, is it's almost like a, a Biggest Loser program, right? So like the really terrible performing buildings out there, right? They all have a great opportunity to improve, and that's what we've seen on some projects we've worked on. But, and as one of these kind of comments, a big comment came in, but I'm just kind of kind of get to the point on it, is that what do we do for the really well-performing buildings that want to certify? It seems, you know, in, in the case of the way you've, the program has been set up on a Biggest Loser type style, those that are already really well-performing, how do they get to high levels? Do they just have to cake on extra solar panels and go negative, or how would that work? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's like really, it's, I know right now there is a lot of interest in refinancing um, and accessing the financing benefits that are available for projects when they have a green certification. So there's a lot of projects that were recently built, like within the last year or two that are coming to us and they're saying, how can I be certified? Can I go the renovation route? And sometimes the answer is, um, maybe because, you know, we're looking at the 2020 NGBS right now, the 2015 version doesn't have that requirement that the building needs to be occupied for at least five years. So they're, they might be able to do the 2015 version if they think that they can hit these 15 and 20% reductions in energy and water, which is sometimes unlikely because they're already so high performing. Um, we started to say that there could be a possibility for some more recently developed buildings to be certified via the new construction route through an appeals process if the team is confident that they can um, demonstrate that all of the mandatory practices, including those that are like behind the walls and covered up post construction, have been met by some means. Like if there is a code official's testimony or photos or something like that. But I think that's going to be rare, and it's going to be challenging to make that case. Um, so there might be some opportunity, but it's going to be tricky. Um, Great. Well, thank you. All right. So we've talked about the expanded definition for residential. We've talked about the commercial space certification. We've talked about renovation. And now we're getting into um, a section that's more geared for those single family builders, developers, and consultants on the line today. So this is a new pathway that applies only to single family homes, townhomes, duplexes, and quads. This is um, chapter 12 or the certified path. Um, for this pathway, the home must comply with all relevant practices and it has the potential to earn the certified level. So in developing this new certification path, the NGBS committee sought to provide an appealing option to a couple parties. So they recognize that production builders are interested in a simplified green certification option that could work across multiple home designs and markets, and even when they had limited control over land construction. They also saw that a simplified green certification option 
could be an appealing entry point for smaller volume builders because it simplified the number of practices that they needed to weed through to find what was meaningful for their homes. And then finally, a simplified green certification option meant that home innovation had the potential for greater market penetration in increasing the number of homes that were built above code and green certified. So for chapter 12, um, most of the mandatory practices from chapters five through 10, those are the compliance chapters for new construction, were carried over. Um, the code baseline is 2018 IECC and IRC, which is higher code than in most states. And then there are, as I said, only mandatory practices, and um, many of those don't have any exceptions. They have to be met in every case. There's a big focus on the most impactful green measures for energy, water, moisture management, and indoor environmental quality. Um, and the energy efficiency requirements are above the bronze certification level. So I'm going to mention that a few times throughout the next couple of slides. Like the this is not a wire a watered down version of the NGBX. This is an alternative, and this is not a pathway that is lower performing or less hard. It still needs to, the homes need to be higher performing, even higher performing than the new construction pathway. And every home must be third party verified, which increases compliance and quality. So as I just said, this is not an easier option. It's an alternative option. Um, the consensus committee wants to increase the number of certified high performance homes being designed and constructed by focusing on the most impactful practices and features that a builder could implement cost effectively. And we know that high-end custom home builders can build NGBS green certified homes and their home buyers can easily pay for those green features and products. But for many builders, there are still barriers for constructing a verified high performance above code home. And this pathway was designed to help remove some barriers to getting them into a program like the NGBS while still getting a credible and rigorous um, certification. So these are the sections of chapter 12. Lot development, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, indoor environmental quality, and homeowner operations and maintenance. For lot development, this is limited to practices for um, that the committee believed that the builder could control, as opposed to those that are typically influenced by the developer of a community. Um, chapter 12 requires that the lot either not be within a floodplain or be elevated above the floodplain. The lot must be sloped away from the home. Soil must be tilled or new soil added to prepare it for new plants. A landscape plan must be developed. Regionally appropriate vegetation must be selected. And finally, natural resources such as trees and other resources um, must be considered on the landscape plan and protected during construction. So a lot of those are mandatory practices for the new construction pathway. They've been pulled out. So there's just a, um, a very streamlined section on lot development in chapter 12. For resource efficiency, this section includes um, practices that focus on moisture management to enhance the home's durability. Um, most of the mandatory practices from chapter six are carried over here. And these include practices related to damp proof walls, ceiling crawl spaces, flashing, ice barriers, et cetera. For energy efficiency, chapter 12 includes three options for, to demonstrate compliance. First, there's the performance path where there's energy modeling to show 7.5% performance above the 2018 IECC. There's also an ERI target path and a prescriptive path. For the ERI target path, that's a um, minimum of eight points less than EPA national ERI target required. And of course, the prescriptive path is a checklist of mandatory items. So this chart shows how the different NGBS um, levels for 2015 and 2020 compare to code requirements, Energy Star, and um, and lead as well. And so you can see here in the red circle, this is the NGBS 2020 certified path. It's about on par with the silver level 
certification for the 2020 NGPS and um, the Energy Star Certified Homes 3.1 version. So it's nothing to sneeze at. It's, it's definitely higher performing um, above code for most states. Um, a couple other notes about energy efficiency. For this chapter, sampling of energy efficiency measures is explicitly prohibited. So verifiers must inspect and verify all efficiency measures for the home to be compliant. Building envelope testing is required. Ducts must be tested if the ducts and air handlers are located um, within the building thermal envelope. And then insulation, insulation must be verified to grade one per the NGBS chart. And then if appliances are installed, they must be Energy Star or equivalent. And then finally, 95% lighting must be high efficacy, hardwired or high efficiency bulbs. For water efficiency, there's two compliance pathways, performance and prescriptive. The performance uh, path is based on the water rating index and the project must achieve a 70 or below. I'm gonna talk about the water rating index in a few minutes. And then for the prescriptive path, there's a checklist of mandatory items related to lavatory faucets, toilets, and irrigation. For indoor environmental quality, there are um, several notable practices. At least 85% of the interior architectural coatings must be low VOC. Um, spot ventilation for the bathroom and kitchen must meet minimum requirements. Whole building ventilation is required in accordance with Appendix B, and the homeowner's manual must include an explanation of the importance of ventilation. Um, either a passive or active radon control system is necessary, and then the HVAC system must be protected during construction. And then the final section of Chapter 12 is homeowner operation and maintenance. So a lot of these practices are carried over from Chapter 10 of the new construction pathway. Um, homeowners must be trained in a manual provided to ensure compliance um, and ongoing operation that supports the green design of the home. Um, the training must cover HVAC filters, water heater settings, whole home ventilation, and operation of equipment. And um, yep, yeah, that's about it. So that was the certified path. I'm sure there's questions, so I'll pause for a minute before moving forward. Um, on sampling, you had mentioned you can't sample energy efficiency measures. How does that, I don't know if you were just talking about in one home in general, or how does that play out on really large communities or multifamily where it can be cost prohibitive to try to do all that testing? Yeah, so home innovation only allows sampling for multifamily projects. We don't allow it for any single family homes. Um, that's a, a choice that we made as an adopting entity, but we wanted to note that the standard itself identifies that sampling is not allowed for the certified path for energy efficiency in particular. Do you want more detail than that? Is that fine? No, no, I think, and so you can do energy efficiency sampling on multifamily? Yes, on multifamily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that was it. Thanks. All right. So two more sections to go. Um, the next section is focused on the water efficiency performance path. Um, the 2020 NGBS introduced a new pathway for demonstrating water efficiency that's based on the water rating index or WRI. This pathway is embedded within the provisions for new construction and the single family certified path, which we just walked through. The water rating index provides a numeric value that indicates how efficient the building's water use is compared to a baseline. The building can earn zero to 100. A zero score means that um, the home is completely self-sufficient based on captured rainwater, gray water, et cetera. 100 is much more inefficient use of water. Um, a building needs to achieve at least a 70 or below for bronze level certification or the certified um, compliance for a single family. Um, points are achieved through calculations based on the site water conservation and it must be verified 
on site. So the I'm really excited about this because there's a lot of discussion in the market about various water ratings. I think Florida Water Star has been around for quite some time, but now there's also the WERS program as well as HERS H2O. And I think the WRI option within the NGPS allows a project to get the green certification and get that water rating that can provide more insight into the expected water use all at the same time through a streamlined experience. Um, so this would provide an option opportunity for builders to get two recognitions through one process and one fee and set their home apart from other green certified homes. And the project would get a customized green certificate that shows that water rating index right on there and has an explanation for the homeowner in terms of what that means. Um, it also there's the potential for the homes to earn the NGBS Green Plus Zero Water Badge, which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. The WRI calculator is designed to, um, you know, calculate the baseline WRI and then get the preliminary and final WRI scores based on the water use of installed and verified features. Um, our calculator shows an annual indoor and outdoor water use shown as gallons per year, and it generates that zero to 100 score. So at design, a team can use the WRI calculator to evaluate various design choices to understand their impact on water use and expected points. And then they can pursue that final certified WRI score and get that total cost of ownership to communicate with their home buyers. So the key components addressed by the water rating index are water devices and structural waste for indoor. Um, structural waste is essentially like the water that's within the pipes. Um, it's based on the hot water delivery design. For um, water capture, Rainwater, gray water, black water available for reuse, and then outdoor water use, the landscape use and non-landscape use, such as pools, spas, and fountains. So here's the process. So during the design phase, a WRI verifier will meet with the builder or design team to assess the baseline and calculate a preliminary or a design WRI score. Um, the selected water efficient features will be incorporated into the construction of the home or building. And then during the final inspection, the WRI verifier will confirm the features present and generate a final WRI score. That verification packet is submitted to Home Innovation and a completed and signed WRI final page must be included. And then when we issue the certification, the WRI score will be included right on the certificate so the homeowners can see that. And, and really get a sense for what that means. So that's the water rating index in a nutshell, very high level. And Brett, do we have any questions? Yeah, um, just wondering if somebody wants to use like the water efficiency rating score or HERS H2O, can they utilize that uh, for their savings? No, it's based on the water rating index as in the NGPS. Okay. Um, um, and then you said oh, a, a, a WRI a rater or assessor, is that something different than the green verifier? Is that a, sta a standalone certification? How does that work? Yeah, so it's, it's available to existing accredited verifiers that have done the 2020 training. Mm -hmm. It's an option for them if they want specialized training in the water rating, if they want to deliver that to their clients that they can get that additional training and recognition to be able to deliver that. Okay. And are those calculators uh, based within your checklist or are those standalone somewhere else? They're standalones. They're, we're going to make those available to the verifiers that have gone through that specialized training. Okay. Well, it sounds like a whole entire other session that maybe we can have you all back for when it's here because it seems really important. So thank you. Awesome. I, I welcome that. All right, so final section today is NGBS Green Plus. 
Um, this is a new opportunity that recognizes green certified homes that go above and beyond certain areas of green practice. Um, so with NGBS Green Plus, builders don't need to seek additional certifications or ratings to highlight their home's special features. It provides a streamlined, supplementary, third-party recognition that's based on their higher level performance within the NGBS criteria. So let's say a home wanted to demonstrate that it's net zero. Um, right now, a lot of builders would think that they need to get um, the DOE zero energy ready home label, which would inquire Energy Star certification and indoor air plus labeling. So that's like three additional recognitions that need to be pursued, three additional new partnerships. And that's all separate from the green certification. Now there's an opportunity for homes that are green certified, but also higher performing, like net zero or higher performing in another area to get additional built in recognition through Home Innovations NGBS green program. And our program really capitalizes on the fact that consumers rely on visuals. Like we know from market research that consumers want green homes, but they also are seeking things that are specialized and aligned with their values. They want smart homes, they want healthy homes, they want um, resilient homes. And the NGBS Green Plus um, recognition really highlights those additional specialized features in a visual way that consumers can really get latch onto to know that that green certified home is what they're looking for. It aligns with their values. So we think that this is going to be important for builders to set themselves apart from their competition, particularly in areas where there's a lot of um, really positive competition. A lot of builders pursuing high above code programs are ready. Um, you know, the NGBS Green Plus program was first suggested by one of our program partners up in uh, the Pacific Northwest, who saw that all of his competition was getting a green certification, often higher levels like silver, gold, emerald. And he wanted to distinguish his homes that were healthier and net zero among those that are um, available on the market at the time. I also see investors and affordable housing organizations utilizing the badges to um, to require that projects that are funded through their programs have the features that align with their priorities, such as wellness or resilience. Um, so for example, a couple of the affordable housing organizations that I've been monitoring um, have started to really prioritize um, occupant health. And I think if they move from requiring not just green certification, but green certification plus some of the wellness badge for NGBS that can really make sure that they are um, funding projects that not just are performing better environmentally, but also really co uh, contribute toward um, the betterment and life improvement of the residents that live within their funded projects. So there are six options zero water, universal design, wellness, net zero energy, smart home, and resilience. Um, for any of these badges to be pursued, the project must be seeking the 2020 NGBS certification. The criteria for the badges is based on practices within the 2020 NGBS. And most of these badges are available for both new construction and renovation with this section being zero water. Zero water is only available for new construction. And so the compliance is based on installed and verified features at time of construction. So for none of these, pra none of these badges is there a requirement for post-occupancy verification and reporting. It's all done at time of construction. Um, there's a couple additional uh, document signature pages at final inspection, but it's really very streamlined. Um, so the 2020 tools have new badge tabs. And so these tabs pull in content 
from the other sections of the scoring tool to reflect those practices that are either claimed or awarded um, as part of the regular certification process. And so the badge tabs are a place where the um, designer or the verifier can go to see how close they are to meeting one or more badges. And in some cases, they might be earned already um, based on the design of the home. Um, like for example, universal design, if they already are um, pursuing ADA compliance for all of their units, they might already be hitting that without additional effort. Um, for net zero energy and zero water, there's a little bit more documentation beyond these badge tabs, but really it's really designed to be streamlined. Um, so we've only done, we've only issued one badge so far, and that was the wellness badge for a project that was up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I think there's a couple projects that are tentatively pursuing the zero water badge in the near future, but I'm really excited to start to see the projects that come in that are achieving the badges. I think they're gonna be really diverse. And I think there's gonna be a lot of unique stories to tell. So Brett, do you have any questions or comments on the badge content that we walked through? One was the clarification. So Green Plus is only available for 2020 NGBS? Correct, yep. Um, uh, so, you know, um, any reason to uh, exclude existing homes from net zero water. I mean, I, we, we've seen existing homes achieve it before. So what's the, any, any specific reasoning there or what are the thought behind that? Yeah, it's because the NGBS only has the water rating index for new construction. Um, so we're designing the water rating index tools to just be available for new construction. And then the zero water badge is based on that. Um, because for renovation, the performance path isn't based on the water rating index, it's based on that percent achievement from before to after, the, the, it's not aligned. They're two very different animals. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that wraps us up today. We walked through the key changes of the 2020 NGBS, we looked at the expanded definition that will significantly expand the scope of the program and the standard. We talked about the mixed use building certification with the options being core and shell and full fit out. We talked about major changes to the renovation section that make it more flexible. Um, and there was the addition of the new prescriptive paths. We looked at the new certified level for single family talked about how that's similar or different from new construction. We looked at the water efficiency performance tool, the WRI. And then finally, we wrapped up with the NGBS green recognition opportunity. So I'll wait a couple more minutes on the line. If there's any other questions coming in, we can talk through those. Yeah, definitely. We do have some more questions and we've got time for questions and before I get to those questions just real quick here um, sorry uh, you jumped into the real quick I didn't expect it so fast uh, here we go oh shoot Uh, so yeah, real quick for you who want your CEUs, uh, check out uh, the survey that pops up at the end. If you want them, uh, if you missed that survey, please take it again. If you're taking this course in the future on demand, make sure to get that quiz with an 80% passing rate. And then real quick, you can find that, one of the uh, areas where you can find that quiz is on our YouTube channel. Click on the YouTube link, logo. On the left there, you can see, click on the show more to get more of a description. On the right, you will see the Dropbox uh, or the think um, now the Thinkific platform see you quiz take your quiz and I see some more questions coming in please put them in we do have some time but um, real quick a huge thanks to our uh, top tier uh, sponsors 
uh, Mitsubishi Electric. Um, oh, there goes my slides. Uh, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, Build Equinox, uh, CERV, and um, to uh, uh, Reem Prestige, as well as our board of directors, our volunteers, and all of our members who allow us to do what we do. So yeah, um, let's see some of the questions here. Cindy is what happened? So um, actually there was a, an, an earlier question um, and I'm gonna use it this question to help answer that one. And, and Cindy, maybe you can add to it a little bit as we go through. But somebody had asked, you know, at the beginning of the session, how does this compare to lead? And I said, stick around. If you know a lead, you can make those comparisons yourself as we're going through each of these items. But this is a big one. It's obviously in lead, you sort of have your bare minimums and then you start chasing points all over the place. With NGBS, we know that you, as you just mentioned, we have to you have to hit those thresholds in each of the green categories. So the question here is, what happens if somebody falls short in one of those categories, in one of those threat for the thresholds, for whatever level they're trying to get to? Are there other ways to make it up, or is that just kind of the the way it is? You can't like put more emphasis somewhere else to do that, or or has that changed at all in 2020? So I think when you're comparing NGBS to LEED, LEED has 100 credits to choose from, but the NGBS has over 600. So mm -hmm. there could be practices that, you know, you might be looking at that like, okay, we probably need those, but that will require some effort to collect the documentation and get over to our verifier. I'm going to, you know, not mark those as something that we're pursuing right now. So you might have more back. Oh, still with me, Cindy? I can't hear you anymore. Can anyone else hear her? I, Can you I hear cannot. Me? Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. So I don't know when I got cut off, but I was saying that for a lead, you only have 100 credits. You have over yep. 600 with NGBS. So there's more opportunity to add things that you know are compliant, but you might not be getting verified or you might not be pursuing explicitly early on. Um, and then those point thresholds are pretty rigid that you need to hit those point thresholds in each and every category and overall. Um, there's two new things with the 2020 that make it a little bit more flexible. So there's now a greater opportunity for people to appeal and submit, um, innovative practices that they think are worthy of points. So previously that opportunity was only available for energy efficiency, but now those innovative practices of all types could be submitted for review and included within any chapter. And I think that's really great because the NGBS, we certified to that for often five, six years. And so there's new practices that might be emerging that we can incorporate in and have recognized. And then also with the 2020, there's a new provision noted that if a builder demonstrates that they just simply cannot meet the point threshold of chapter five because they don't have control of any of the land development activities on their site, they can appeal and have a lower point threshold mm. identified for them. So we haven't seen anyone use either of those exceptions yet, but it does offer a little bit more flexibility with this new version. Um, and then just to clarify, you can get the other badges, um, right? You can get the other badges for, for renovations. It's just the water one, correct? Yep, pretty much all the badges are available for both new construction and renovation. It's just the zero water one is only available for new construction. Okay. Um, another question I had here was, um, sorry, it threw me way off when my slide shut down and, and I'm still all, <laughs> I'm still all confused. Um, but anyway, what is your program available in other countries besides the U S not at this time. So, We've certified projects in pretty much every state of the U.S. as well as Puerto Rico. And we've got quite a few projects registered within Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. Um, we'd be open to certifying 
in other countries, but it would be um, that there'd be a need to demonstrate like how that country's reference standards align with the ICC codes because the NGBS is based on like the ICC, IRC, IBC compliance as like the reference. Um, so some work would need to be done to translate it into um, other countries that use a different baseline code. Got it. Um, so one cut question that came from our session last week when we did the smart market report was just um, all this data that's collected on what uh, what builders are doing. Um, so one question I have is um, is uh, um, is it uh, like when you're doing a multifamily development, uh, or not a multi? I'm sorry, when you're when you're aggregating all the data in your checklist because you have all this data on what builders are using. Do you have um, anything that you share out on like what's being used from a green standpoint? Um, just collecting all this information, even if it's at a high level, like you know, most folks are putting this much effort into water or energy. Yeah. So we can do that on a very limited basis right now. Um, we're going to have a couple of blogs coming out in the next couple of weeks that talk mm -hmm. about how builders are deciding between the different water efficiency paths and what the typical energy performance and her score of certified homes. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't been able to do that to a great extent because it requires a lot of effort to mine that data from our scoring tools. Mm -hmm. um, however, over the next year, we're moving to a more online process where all of our submissions from partners and all of our QA and certification review is done on an online platform that's based on the, you know, Pivotal Energy Solutions um, access data, mm -hmm. um, the access platform. And when we make that shift to be more online, we're going to have much greater opportunity to mine data. And I expect to pull a lot more useful data from our scoring tools that we can use and create resources that can direct partners to the practices that are most relevant to them. Um, I'll also note that right now we do have um, what we call bronze cookbooks. Um, and mm -hmm. Rick has that link that he can put in the chat box. Um, these are completed scoring tools um, based on the practices we see builders selecting most often for single family projects. So that can be a good resource if you're getting started and want to see um, what's typical for the average single family home that's coming through our program. Um, you can download those at homeinnovation.com slash bronze cookbook. Great, yeah, yep, I can send that. Uh that link out. Um, and then uh, I think unless there's any other questions, the last one is uh, when is the cutoff date for 2015? When will 2020 be mandatory? We haven't yet set a sunset deadline for 2015. Um, we expect to keep certifying to that for at least several more years, maybe, you know, four to six years, but haven't published any specific headlines at this point. Um, we do, you know, tell our partners that the NGBS is designed to be an above code program. So in the cases where your state has adopted like the 2018 code, I would encourage you to consider the 2020 version first as like the default option, but that's guidance is not a requirement. Great, great. Um, well, Cindy, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to the Home Innovation Lab for having you out here. Um, just real quick, uh, where can people go to get more information or contact you if they want to learn more? Yeah, so my email and phone is up here right now. Um, and the main landing page for all of our green information is homeinnovation.com slash green. And you can find links off of that landing page to our green scoring tools, to our bronze cookbook, and to other resources to help you get started. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there. Stay healthy. And we hope to see you in person uh, soon. Take care. Goodbye. Great. Thanks, Brett. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube 
to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.